Oh, that's good. Silence. Hello. Uh, welcome back onto the University of Manchester campus. It's lovely to see so many of you here. I will have met some of you, but not others, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Claire Kilner. I'm Head of Alumni here at the University, and I hope very much to meet with some of you at the reception afterwards. We're delighted to have you all here for the annual prestigious Cockcroft Rutherford Lecture, hosted by our President and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell, and delivered this year by Professor Danielle George. Professor George has, I'm reliably informed, prepared an exciting and engaging lecture for us tonight, so I'm excited to see it. Uh, you will notice that you have a voting pad in front of you. Please, can you ensure that you don't press any buttons? <clears throat> so, no, you know, when you see a sign for wet paint and you can't resist but touch to see if it really is, <laughs> please don't press any buttons until you're prompted so that we can ensure that all pads work correctly when voting is taking place. Can I also ask you to ensure that your telephones are switched off or put onto silent? We are live streaming tonight uh, and we are recording, um, so that would also be really helpful. We are not expecting a fire alarm test this evening, so if the alarm sounds, it's the real thing, and staff around the auditorium will help you to evacuate the building. The uh, facilities are through the theatre do doors on both sides and on the ground floor near the lift, should anybody require them. We will have members in the audience who are live tweeting, so if you see somebody looking at their phone, they're not bored, I can guarantee it. Um, they will be live tweeting and the hashtag will appear on screen hopefully. Um, it's very simple, it's hashtag, hashtag Cockroft Rutherford. And so please do take part and live tweet along with us. Right, that's everything. I'll now hand over to our President and Vice-Chancellor who will formally introduce Professor George. I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. So thank you, Claire, and a warm welcome, everybody. Hands up who's pressed the button already. <laughs> oh, you didn't. Well, that's it now. Anyway, a very, very warm welcome from me and my colleagues in the university to all of you here, our alumni, donors, friends, staff, and students. Um, and welcome to this annual Cockroft Rutherford Lecture. This is the primary event for our alumni during the year. And I'm delighted that so many of you have been able to be here. This event honours Sir John Cockcroft, uh, an alumnus of the university, and Lord Ernest Rutherford uh, for their outstanding research. Both in their own right uh, were in incredible scientists and engineers, and of course, they also worked together. I've just had the pleasure of reading a fantastic book given to me by Joe Dweck called The Fly in the Cathedral, which was the story of the splitting of the atom, and indeed, it's remarkable in that book how many of the people came from Manchester, including the company that they worked with. I highly recommend it to you. So I'm very pleased to see some of the uh, Cockcroft uh, family here today. Uh, you're particularly welcome. The University of Manchester has the largest alumni community of any campus-based university in the UK, and we're in regular contact with, with over 320,000 former students all over the world. And it's a great pleasure when I go to Singapore or to China or to India to meet so many graduates of the university. We are particularly lucky to have a group of alumni who want to stay connected with us, wherever they are, um, and, and particularly thanks to those alumni amongst you who are so, so supportive of the university. And that support comes in the form, obviously, of financial support, but also in giving your time generously and helping to mentor and support our students. And in fact, uh, nearly 6,000 alumni provided guidance and motivation to students through volunteering activity over the year. And in this academic year, well over 5,000 made donations to support scholarships, research, and student projects. So a big thank you again. This year has been a busy one. Uh, we were delighted to install Lem Sissi as our new chancellor um, in Foundation Day in October last year, after he was voted in, indeed, by our alumni community as well as our, our staff as also. Um, and that was a, a fantastic event. Uh, we were honoured to host the visit of, of President Xi of China, which was, took some organising, but nevertheless um, uh, was uh, 
obviously broadcast around the world, and it seems that we're now even more popular with Chinese than we were before. Um, our £1 billion investment plan in the campus has seen the completion of several award-winning buildings. The Whitworth Art Gallery, which won Museum of the Year and many prizes, the Manchester Cancer Research Centre, and, of course, the National Graphene Institute. And we are well underway with the rest. As you cannot have failed to have noticed, we're digging up or knocking down large parts of the campus, as you heard earlier, soon to be rebuilt. The two largest of those projects are the Alliance Manchester Business School, which is, apologies, causing the road to be closed at the moment, a £70 million project, and what is currently a big pile of rubble, if you've noticed it, opposite the National Graphene Institute, which will be the Manchester Engineering Campus Development. Uh, this is a £350 million project, and it's incredibly important because it will bring all of our engineers, staff and students, onto the main campus, and will be also a place for research, for teaching, but it'll be one where passers-by, visitors can actually see what's happening inside uh, this amazing building. And in fact, there is a stand downstairs if you want to see what it's going to be looking like. Our research in science and engineering, the top topic of, of uh, this lecture is going from strength to strength. And I mentioned the National Graphene Institute featuring prominently in many uh, news items and events. We were proud to be announced as the he international headquarters of the Square Kilometre Array to be based at Jodrell Bank. We're now planning, uh, and again knocking things down, for the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre, the GEEK, and of course the Sir Henry Royce Institute of um, Advanced Materials will be built just close by, uh, very close to the National Graphene Institute. This year, Manchester is European City of Science, and that's because we're hosting the Euroscience Open Forum, the largest pan-science um, conference uh, in Europe, which will be held at Manchester Central. The university, together with the city, are the co-hosts, and we're actually, the title of it is Science as a Revolution, from Cottonopolis to Graphene City. So it will be featuring five Nobel laureates, including two of our own, and a number of uh, people who are quite prominent, um, including other professors of physics who may be well known to you. So we are very privileged tonight uh, that we have Professor Danielle George uh, lecturing to us. Um, Danielle is a professor in the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences, where she's also the Vice Dean for Teaching and Learning. Uh, and in her spare time, she does a great deal of public events. So Danielle was made a professor at the age of only 38, and um, she studied, in fact, at the, both the former institutions, with a BSc in astrophysics, and then a master's in radio astronomy at Jodrell Bank, and then a PhD in electrical and electronic engineering. And indeed, um, as I think she'll mention, her research was very close to the heart of John Cockcroft. She worked at Jodrell as a senior radio uh, frequency engineer until 2006 uh, and then took up a lectureship in the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering and then became professor. So Danielle, like many of us, was fascinated by science from an early age. It's very often something that stimulates the imagination that results in people going on to be leading scientists and engineers. She was given a telescope by her parents when she was eight years old and apparently used to regularly get up in the middle of the night uh, to watch uh, the lunar eclipse or other stars, which must have annoyed her parents intensely. Um, she credits this experience as the moment that she first realised how physics and maths could be applied outside the classroom and as the f it was the first step on the path to her current career. Danielle's experience in uh, radio frequency and microwave communications has a wide range of applications, and, a number of and she's working with a number of industries. Her research and development um, uh, work has been carried out uh, on areas such as ultra-low noise receivers for space and aerospace applications. So in 2014, Danielle gave the Royal Institution Christmas lectures shown on the BBC. I was so proud because I gave those lectures many years before. And uh, she gave the lectures also in Singapore and Japan. And together we attended a fantastic event at the Royal Institution um, uh, just a few months ago, where 19 of the 25 living Christmas lecturers were present, including my great hero, David Attenborough. And it was a fantastic event. Um, she's also done many other um, public events. She's been on BBC Radio Life Scientific, The Infinite Monkey Cage. Uh, she's done the contemporary great uh, conference at, in our hometown of Newcastle, and she'll be featuring very heavily in European City of Science. 
She is pas passionate about raising pu public awareness of the positive impact of engineering on all aspects of our life, and particularly that girls can be great engineers as well. And what better role model, and what better person to give tonight's uh, annual Cockroft Rutherford Lecture than Danielle George, who's going to talk about citizen scientists' um, anarchy among the engineers. Danielle, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it's a it's a great honour to, to give this lecture, especially this year as Manchester is European City of Science. Um, they say if you're, if you're nervous uh, before a talk, um, find out a bit about your audience and, um, and find out a bit about their backgrounds. So like a good student, um, I googled some of you. And, uh, and whilst I don't think that helped to um, solve my nerves any less, um, I was actually in awe of, of some of the work that, that you do. Uh, there are some inspiring people in this room this evening. It was really pleasing to hear um, by Nancy from Christopher Cockcroft about his, his late father. And obviously we all know the work that he did um, in nuclear physics, but actually he was an RF engineer like myself. And it was that skill that was used um, as um, uh, needed in, in World War II as well. So I'm very much looking forward to having some interesting questions afterwards and then meeting some of you after my lecture as well. Um, so let's get started with some tech. If you have resisted the urge to tinker with your clicker, you're doing better than my undergrads because um, they tinker with all the time and some of them even get the screwdrivers out and start to <laughs> reverse engineer, which of course you can't see anything bad against because it's engineering. So, um, so let's get started with the first question. Get your clickers out. <laughs> <laughs> and start voting. Can you use your clicker? Yes, no, I really wish a child was here to help me on this. So we're getting lots of votes, brilliant. All right, I'll stop it there then. Let's see what we get. So we've had nearly 400. Might take a while, because there's nearly 400 um, clickers here. Let's see how many we get on the C. This will be interesting. <laughs> and if the voting doesn't work, like it did <laughs> this morning, <laughs> I need to think of a whole new talk for you for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Let's assume that we can vote and go on to the next one. And if this doesn't work, we'll just go back to the good old fashioned raising our hands. Who considers themselves as a scientist or engineer? If you agree that you do consider yourself as a scientist or engineer, if you disagree, you think, oh, I'm not quite sure, maybe, or you still wish that child was here to help you with it. Falling close, right, brilliant, technology. <laughs> okay, so we have 47%, not bad. 3% um, still wish that child was here to help them, brilliant. <laughs> okay, I want to convince you that we're all born scientists or engineers um, here tonight. And I want to convince you that it's all of our jobs, every single one of us in this room, without exception, to inspire that next generation of scientists and engineers as well. Did you ever do this when you were a child? Nicely colored wooden blocks and build them up, yeah? Did you also do this and knock them all down, yeah? Why do we do that? Did you drive your teachers mad by asking why all the time, or your parents mad asking why all the time. Why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? Why, why, why? I have a 16-month-old daughter, Elizabeth, and she, she only says a few words at the moment, but I'm sure that one of the first sentences she will construct will start with why is. 
Um, it's a fundamental question we all ask ourselves. So what are children wondering when they're building these bricks? Why can I build it? Why can those things stay on top of one another? How can I build something bigger? How can I knock it down again? So we ask why and how so many times. And these are the fundamental questions for any scientist and any engineer. That why question is fundamental to any science and the how question is fundamental to any engineer. So the why is the inner scientist in you and the how is the inner engineer in you. I think we all need to inspire the next generation to make sure that they are asking those questions why and how. Because if they're not asking those questions, who is going to solve these big world grand challenges that we're facing now and in the future? So I'd like to share with you tonight some ways that I'm hopefully trying to help inspire that next generation. Um, starting with something that happened to me a few weeks ago. Have you ever been in that situation where you're proudly talking about your work and what you do and then you finish and somebody goes, why bother? What's the point in that? <laughs> That's what happened to me a few weeks ago. In my research, I engineer the tools for scientific discovery, which is one of the 14 world engineering grand challenges. And I was giving a public lecture and talking about the very first project I worked on. It was called the Planck Mission, and it was an amazing project to work on as a junior engineer at Jodrell Bank Observatory. It was a joint mission between the North American Space Agency, NASA, and the European Space Agency, ESA. Um, and we out at Jodrell Bank were tasked with um, designing and developing what was called the low frequency instrument for the Planck spacecraft. So for anyone who's in the engineering domain, this low frequency was at 30 gigahertz, three zero gigahertz. So this is fairly high frequency, um, but this was the low frequency for this instrument. And we also had the Planck scientist out at Jodrell Bank as well. Uh, the Planck scientist was um, Professor uh, Richard Davis, who was sadly very recently passed away, um, and I feel very honored to have worked with him uh, on this project for many years. Um, he was a, a great man and a, the type of astronomer who, who really got the, the engineering and the instrumentation side of things as well. So, so we had a great time working on this project. Um, the uh, Planck was a radio frequency instrument, so it was designed to look at the naturally occurring radiation in our universe. So instead of using visible light, we were using radio waves instead. It was a radio frequency instrument designed to, to look back at the dawn of the universe, so some 13.8 billion years ago. Now at that time, the universe was filled with a hot, dense soup of protons, electrons, and photons. And when these protons and electrons combined, they joined, uh, they, they formed hydrogen and light was released. And that light today has been stretched to the microwave wavelengths and is called the cosmic microwave background or the CMB radiation. And it's effectively the oldest light in the universe imprinted on our skies when the universe was just 380,000 years old. So we want to be able to very accurately map this cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB. So the map uh, previously, before Planck was launched, one of the early maps of the CMB looked like this. So you can see it's a color map where the color represents different temperatures. And the tiny fluctuations in these temperatures represent changes in density that would then go on to form all of the seeds uh, and the structures in, in our universe, so the, the galaxies and the stars of today. So we want to be able to produce very accurate maps of this CMB. So Planck was launched and sent up to a place called Lagrange Point 2, or L2, and, uh, which is about 1.5 million kilometers further away from the sun than we are here on Earth. And this is what the map looked like after 15 and a half months worth of data. So you can see there's a lot more resolution, a lot more sensitivity in this map. And that means we can much more accurately understand the foundations of our universe from its birth up until the present day. So I was talking about this project and, um, and all of the um, 
engineering and technical innovation required for, for such a, a space mission. And I finished, and I was sort of getting ready for, for some of the questions. And this audience was quite um, an eclectic mix of people. So we had people who had already worked in industry and were retired, people who were still working in industry. We had families with their children. We had grandparents with their grandchildren. Um, we had lots of school children in there as well. So I was sort of preparing myself for an eclectic mix of questions, but not the question I got. Because the question, the very first question I got was, why bother? How are we benefiting from all of this technical innovation in space? And I was quite put on the back foot, so I very quickly started going, oh, um, well, you know, there's the sensors in your uh, smartphone cameras, a lot of that came from astronomy projects. Um, X-ray astronomy has given us advances in security. Instrumentation for the Mars mission is now used to analyze luggage explosives. Um, and then I started sort of rambling, going, oh, well, the space mission gave us Velcro and nonstick pans. It, you know, I really started <laughs> rambling about things. And, um, and of course, how, as humans, we are naturally very curious. And so this helps to satisfy or feed our curiosity. Now, thankfully, my, my answers um, appeased the man at, at the public lecture. And we went on to more technical questions and, and very much back into my comfort zone. But afterwards, I reflected on my answers, and I wasn't happy with them. Why did that man ask that question in the first place? Surely everyone knows why technical innovation matters. To me, it's like saying my food matters. But clearly, I was wrong. And it reminded me of the times and comments I hear from school children when I'm talking to them about the work of an engineer. Wow, I didn't know engineers did that. Society, including children, has an understanding of what many professions do, such as medicine, because we've all had first-hand experience of it. So it's ironic that engineering and technical innovation is everywhere, but it's invisible because it's woven into the very fabric of everyday life. Many people simply do not know what engineers do or why technical innovation matters. But why should they if we aren't out there helping them to understand and showing them how ingenious engineers are and why technical innovation matters? Every single one of us has a right to understand science and engineering and how it changes our everyday life so that we can all inspire that next generation to make sure that they understand it as well. So whilst what I said to the man at the public lecture was true about how different industries have benefited from space exploration, actually it's true the other way around. Telescopes were first developed for naval travel, rockets for artillery, so it's a two-way thing, and it needs to be a two-way thing going forward. In this time of big data and the Internet of Things, this networking of physical objects or things with the ability to connect and exchange data. Every two days, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of time up until 2003. That's according to Eric Schmidt of Google fame. And that's something like five exabytes of data, he thinks. So let me just repeat that. In the past two days, we have created as much information as we did from the dawn of man up until 2003. Now, researchers suggest that there will be 25 billion interconnected things by 2020. And I believe they will play an underpinning role in helping us to solve these big engineering grand challenges, including engineering the tools for scientific discovery. And I'd like to share some examples with you tonight on how my work is doing that. For example, more than 2.8 billion people are still affected by water scarcity. And that number is only going to increase as the need to feed a growing population also increases. Now, there are a number of projects trying to implement subsoil sensing technologies to measure and monitor subsoil sensing parameters, such as the soil temperature, moisture, and nutritional ingredients needed for crop growth. So the project I'm working on seeks to um, integrate subsoil sensing technology and wireless communication, radio frequency identification, or RFID technology. 
So what you see here are little nodes buried in the soil, and those nodes are taking data of the soil. Then you have, on the tractor, you have a reader on, on the front of the tractor so that the information from the node is sent wirelessly to the reader on the tractor. Now that allows the farmer to determine what action to take based on the results that they are getting. So we're trying to shift towards a model of precision agriculture and so helping to tackle the challenge of world food and water shortages using radio waves and wireless communication. Or consider jet engines. Aeroplanes are mission critical vehicles and as such, we want them to be safe, reliable and also efficient. And so during their development, large engines such as this are instrumented with hundreds, sometimes even thousands of sensors. And currently these sensors are hardwired to a data acquisition unit and because they're hardwired, they are inflexible, they're expensive, it's very time consuming to set up, and also they're susceptible to cable and connector faults. So we're looking for a wireless sensor network solution. So get rid of these wires and have a wireless solution inside the engines. So imagine one of these engines, and I say imagine one of these engines, you know, it's bigger than this room sort of thing, but imagine one of these engines, and Imagine having a wireless sensor network inside this engine, monitoring data, so taking data of engine temperature, its vibration, etc. And imagine adding a node to that network was quick, simple, and low cost. The amount of data we could gather from that engine increases because we can increase the number of nodes in there. So the more data we have on that engine, the more likely we are to be able to design a much more efficient engine in the future, thus reducing the carbon emissions of the world. Again, using our radio waves. Now, this is a, a big, big project. This is a big engine. But what about even larger scale, big instruments using radio waves? Now, we've been looking into uh, deep space, sending signals into deep space and receiving signals from deep space for over a century now. And that's allowed us to realize how much there is in the universe beyond what we think we know. So in the past few decades, larger and more powerful telescopes have been designed to look deeper and deeper into space. And I'm very fortunate to be working with a large international team on building the next one the largest and most powerful radio telescope ever. It's called the Square Kilometer Array, or the SKA. Now the SKA will be made up of hundreds of thousands of uh, radios antennas, and here you can see an artist's rendering of, of what it might look like. But these dishes will be connected and spread across thousands of kilometers, but with a central core in Western Australia and in a remote area of South Africa. Now the sheer size of the SKA will make it 50 times more sensitive than any other radio instrument. And that will allow us to answer key and ambitious questions in cosmology, astrophysics, and fundamental physics. In fact, the SKA will be so sensitive, it will be able to detect an airport radar-like signal on a planet 10 light years away. And the amount of data the SKA will generate is enormous. It's estimated that these dishes alone will generate more than 10 times the global internet traffic. The SKA supercomputer will have to perform 10 to the 18 calculations per second. That's equivalent to the number of stars there are in 3 million of our own galaxies in order to process all of this data. Now these represent huge technical challenges and ones that will only be solved by many people from many different fields working together and from having that next generation inspired enough to work in this field in the future. So for my work, I need industry. I need academia. I need large industry. I need SMEs. And yes, I need citizen scientists. 
this idea of putting data into the public domain is an increasingly popular idea. But actually, it's not new. If anyone remembers the SETI program from years ago, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, this was a citizen data scientist. If you remember, if you had an interconnect, internet connected computer, uh, you could download this program from SETI. And when you weren't using your computer, SETI at home would use um, the, uh, your computer to download the data, to reduce this data and send it back to SETI. So we, we're using citizen scientists, citizen data scientists. But what about engineers? Can we have engineers that are citizens? Can we have citizen engineering? Can we have empowerment without anarchy? Well, this is what we're trying to do with our project in the European City of Science. <laughs> We are trying what I think is the very first large-scale citizen engineering project in the world. Now, we might find out why there's a reason that nobody's done this before, <laughs> but let's see. <laughs> um, but as part of uh, Manchester becoming uh, the first UK city to be European City of Science, we wanted to get the people of Manchester together. We wanted to, to get them involved in the science and the engineering that goes on in our, um, in our city. And I think it was only right that a city that has an international reputation for its science and for its music should join together in some sort of project. And so we're trying to get the scientists, the musicians, and the artists working together. So we're bringing technology, engineering, and music to life with our robot orchestra that's built together and made in Manchester. Now, these electronic brains in, in our robots will have many different, um, will look very, very different from a, a pocket size calculator size piece of electronics in Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, and things that younger people will be very comfortable with to our electronic conductor, which is uh, made by the engineers at Siemens, which they've nicely called graphene because it's going to be a good conductor. <laughs> Engineering joke for you. <laughs> now, um, Siemens, the Siemens engineers have really embraced this project. It's, as an engineer myself, um, it's really taken me out of my comfort zone. We are effectively trying to do an engineering project in the way that you'd never approach an engineering project. There's no specification, there's no system engineer, there's no agreement about what we're going to do before we start this. What we've done is go out to the community and say, hey, we want to build a robot orchestra, let's design it together. So we're crowdsourcing this. But the engineers at Siemens have really embraced this, thankfully. It's taken them out of their comfort zone like it's taken me. But they've embraced it with such enthusiasm and approached it in a, such an innovative way that this project actually needs. And anyone and everyone is helping us to develop this project, this robot orchestra. From five-year-olds at school to 75-year-olds tinkering in their garage and everything in between. We want robots from everyone that look and do as many different things as we can. And here I have some examples uh, tonight. So what we have are this very first one here is the, a drum kit by Siemens, by the Siemens engineers. Now, you might normally find these things, which are electronic switches, um, in large-scale industry, small-scale industry as well. But we wanted to try and get them to create music. So let's see if you hear this drum beat. If anyone is a Freddie Mercury or a Queen fan, that would be good.
when I showed that to a bunch of school children, they started to play um, and sing, We Will Rock You. I won't get you guys to do that, though. <laughs> but you can see it was the drum beat to, or you can hear it's the drum beat to, We Will Rock You. Um, the next one I want to show you is um, our floppy drive orchestra. Now, we wanted to have recycled components, recycled tech in our robot orchestra, and this epitomizes it. Um, thankfully, I'm talking to an audience that does remember floppy drives, which is good. <laughs> there are lots of audience that don't, which is very sad. <laughs> um, but here we have 16 floppy drives, and these things would have just been thrown out. No one would be using them. So a challenge was set, and um, a student uh, from Cardiff University um, took up the challenge and said, right, I'm going to try and create some music from this. So hopefully you'll um, hear this. All, all you'll be hearing now are the motors in the floppy drives moving. So they're 20-year-old motors just moving. And if anyone likes the Rocky films, you might know this. <laughs> has a huge repertoire, so if anyone wants to have a look at it later, <laughs> feel free to look at it. But you can see what we're trying to do, hopefully. You can see that anything and everything is part of this. So we set um, the people of Manchester uh, and beyond uh, a challenge. If, if we can get floppy drives um, and switches that you'd normally find in industry to create music, what can you do? And boy, did they answer us. We've had everything from Pringle crisp containers with pencils to make drum beats. Um, we've had people hacking their keyboards. We've had um, a glockenspiel, which is going to be played uh, electronically. Um, no humans involved at all. And some of these will be downstairs if you haven't seen them already. Um, we've just had everything from school children, like I say, to 75-year-old in, in their garage tinkering. And we've had industry involved in it as well. Um, these robots seem to be going places. These robots need passports because so many people are sort of like, we want this robot orchestra. We want it to, to come and uh, play with us. We've had um, the Metrolink, the tram system, have donated some parts, so recycled tech. So we're going to have a, a robot which will have some um, Metrolink parts to it. Uh, we've had um, the WI, uh, the Women's Institute, are collecting and donating tech for us as well. Uh, we've just had so many different things. The very first performance of this will be in July during the ESOF conference that, that Nancy mentioned. And it will play a piece of music from the Halle. So Steve Pickett, who is the education director, has composed a beautiful piece of music. Um, to work alongside human musicians as well. And I just want to play you a little expert, excerpt of, of what the music will be. This is called Fanfare, The Robots Are Coming. <laughs> say that's challenging even for humans, never mind our robots. So we're having robots and um, human musicians playing together. And that will be the piece of music that, that you'll hear at uh, the ESOF uh, launch of, of the conference as well. So we want anything and everything in terms of our robots. And there's always space for one more robot as well, including a University of Manchester alumni robot. And here it is. 
But the robot actually should be looking down like this. It should be very sad because this robot doesn't work at the moment. <laughs> so what you are going to help me do is design our University of Manchester alumnus robot. And I will have um, two students uh, from, two undergrads from my school, School of Electro and Electronic Engineering, working over the summer on um, creating our alumni robot, getting it to work and getting it to look the way you want it to look. In October, there will be more performances, huge performances, lots of different composers for the, for the robot orchestra. And uh, it will be part of the um, Manchester Science Festival launch in October, November time as well. And then, like I say, who knows where these, these guys need passports. Um, and your robot will be part of that. So I need you to help me design it. So clickers out again. What should the robot play? Percussion, wind, string, or something else. And if it's something else, come and chat to me at the end. Okay, let's see what it says. Oh, let's go back, sorry. A string instrument, great. So you've just given me the hardest challenge ever, thank you. <laughs> okay, so our, our alumni robot's going to play a string instrument, excellent. <laughs> now to actually make it uh, an alumnus or alumna of the University of Manchester, what should it have? We can give it a scarf or hat. If anyone knows someone who can knit a whole outfit, fabulous. Oh, I need to open the polling, sorry. Um, but how will we know when you come to watch this in October in the Museum of Science and Industry, how will you know that's your robot? Go back. Oh, it was a close call. I want to talk to the 14% who know they can knit, knit an outfit. That would be so much better. Come and talk to me at the end. <laughs> but we'll for sure give it a hat, but actually it's so close. We'll probably give it a scarf and a hat as well. Right, this face is a bit sad. I think we should give it a new face. <laughs> so do we want a 3D printed face of a robot? Do we want Lem Sisse's face on here? Do you want your face on it or somebody else's? And if it's C or D, you definitely come and have to come and talk to me at the end. Right, let's see if our polling works. Oh, oh back again. Oh, close. <laughs> Looks like it's Lem Sisters. Nancy, I'll let you tell them that one, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. We'll have the hair under the alumni hat as well. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Right. So we have our robot. You have unleashed your inner scientist and your engineer. You've started to create our robot. This University of Manchester alumni robot is coming and will be part of our, um, our orchestra in October. So please do come and see it. Oh. <laughs> next. Uh, for me, the Robot Orchestra project also has a, has a serious side too. It shows collaboration. It shows that many different people can work together. It shows that scientists, engineers, musicians, artists, the general public, the citizen engineers can work together. It shows we can have citizen engineers and we can create empowerment without that anarchy in it. It shows that it doesn't matter who you are, you can inspire that next generation who want to work on this. This project shows the five-year-old or reminds the 75-year-old how much fun engineering is. And that's the important thing for me. Yes, there's a serious side, but there's a huge fun element to this as well. The fact that we can use a project like this to show and inspire the next generation, show them how much fun science and engineering can actually be. So I started this lecture by asking you uh, the question, who thought they were a scientist or an engineer? And some of you did, but some of you didn't, and there was a, a few maybes as well. I hope now, if I asked you again, there will be more yeses than noes 
or even the no's have just moved into the maybes. And even if I haven't, I hope that we all share our passion, whatever that passion is, with the next generation to inspire that next generation. And I hope I've showed you how important that is to me and how I'm trying to do it in my work as well. It's important that we all do it in our own way, too. So I asked um, a special friend of mine this question. I told her about this, um, uh, this lecture, and I said, um, I'm going to be talking about inspiring your generation and, and why, why you think that's important. And, and so I asked her the question about why she thinks you should inspire her generation. Here's what she said. Are you ready to ask? I need you in the future. So if you help me now, in the future, I can be better than you. <laughs> I'm you in the future. If you help me now, in the future, I can be better than you. So for me, as a mother, a teacher, a researcher, and a member of the University of Manchester, that's got to be a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle, for making us think, making us use technology, which is not usual in a Cockroft Rutherford lecture. I think it's the first time, and also for entertaining us. So many people think that science and engineering is not only difficult, but it's boring. It isn't. It's huge fun. And I think Danielle has shown in many ways why that is the case. So she's agreed to take a few questions, and we do have some microphones if anybody would like to ask questions about what she's talked about, or within reason, anything else. <laughs> Please don't ask me why bother, though. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question. Yes, one right up there. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to know what answer you would give now to the question that floored you. Oh, they are asking you the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I'd probably, I'd probably ramble a bit like I did um, the first time as well. Um, but I'd, I'd think, I'd say um, we bother because we are naturally very curious as humans and there, re there shouldn't really be another reason to do that. I'd also say that space exploration is hugely inspiring to the next generation of anyone who wants to work in science, technology, engineering or, or maths. Um, or indeed other, other subjects as well. There is, there is something about space that we all seem to like um, and, and it, it feeds the curiosity in us and, um, and will help to inspire that next generation. So, yeah, I'd ramble again, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but what can be more exciting, particularly to children, than discovering the unknown? Mm. And that's the most important thing, I think, when you actually do science you suddenly realise I might be the first person in the world that knows this. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. I wonder if you could tell me whether you think the education system in this country is orientated enough towards encouraging people to be both practical and academic. Yeah, I mean, the very short answer is no, I don't think it is. Um, I think uh, there is an awful lot to do. Um, I think we've started in this country and a really good start is getting children to code at primary school now so children um, are, are starting to code they, and they're, they're taking that coding into the hardware world as well but we have so much work to do this idea that that children can't fail in things is wrong um, we fail all the time I fail in my research all the time um, and and that's how I innovate and if we have a generation of, um, of children who feel like they can't fail in anything, that they don't have this resilience, um, then, then we, are, we are designing out um, innovation in this country 
and curiosity in this country as well. So, so I think one of the very first things we need to do is, is let, especially primary school teachers um, and the children, play and tinker and make sure that there is time in the curriculum to do that and to fail and to celebrate those failures. They're fantastic along the way. Well <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We've got one over here and then I'm going to go to one up there. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to take a bit of a time to get into this because I've only just thought of it. We all interact with engineering on a daily basis. Um, and sometimes uh, this presents frustrations. Uh, I will give the example of the folding buggy for, for, for putting children in. I know it well. Um, I'll give the example of uh, garden strimmers, lawn mowers, and I'll give the example of mobile phones, which all these things seem to me to have been presented to consumers in a way that hasn't allowed consumers to be thought of first. Now, it's an engineering problem. You're talking about engaging us with engineering, but engineers at that sort of level could set a jolly good example for getting us involved and better design of consumer product by involving us, making us see that we are engineers in the first place. I offer, the, offer it as a thought for a comment rather than a question. Yes, no, I, I totally agree uh, with, your, with your comments. Um, I think industry are engaging an awful lot more um, with, with universities from, a, from an education point of view, not just a research point of view now as well. And we're all engaging more with um, with schools, but also the, the public. Um, we all have a, a social responsibility. Um, and, and I think engineering uh, companies are starting to do a lot more of that now. And I totally agree. I think we should, whatever it is that we're innovating in, we should get the citizens um, to be part of that project. A very large thing from a, from a research point of view is the impact of our research. And I, I don't think you could have a greater impact um, than if the citizens um, and, the, and the users of the technology actually think it's a good thing and it's easy to work and they've been part of the process. So I totally agree. We need to do a lot more of it. It started, but we need to do an awful lot more of it. I've got a question up there at the back and then two more up near the back as well. How, how do you improve the status of engineers? Ah. In Britain, the, the status of an engineer is something like an oily rag. In Germany and Japan, and America to a certain extent, they have a status which is equivalent to doctors, accountants, etc. And I think they do a damn sight more useful work than the others. <laughs> I'll not comment about the last. Does, does there speak an engineer by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the, the, the status of, of an engineer in this country um, is really bad. The image that, that people have as an engineer, um, I um, the people. Um, who either come to fix my washing machine or come to fix our sky dish or something. My husband cringes if I'm in the house because they come and say, hi, the engineer's here. Really? God, you went, to, you went to university for four years to do this? Have you been your professional engineer? And they're like, no, I'm just, I've just come to fix your washing machine. You know, well, you're not an engineer then. Yeah. So I rant a lot about this. Um, <laughs> and, but it's true, you know, it, it's the, the status thing, and you're right, in Germany, it's a protected word. You're up there with doctors. Um, as a protected word as the engineer. Engineers are ingenious, that's what that word means, and we need to do more in this country to show that engineers are ingenious in it and to, to change the image we have and the public perception of it as well. And this, this is where government has a big role to play in it as well. It was great to see um, at last year's uh, National Women in Engineering Day, um, David Cameron tweeted about it, and there was a, a female engineer, and he was saying, you know, it's great that we have National Women in Engineering Day. But the woman had a hard hat and a, and a big boiler suit on, and you're sort of like, oh, David, you could have got that so right, but, you know, <laughs> hasn't quite First worked. <laughs> um, so so it's this, still this image of the hard hat and the boiler suit, and not all engineers do that. So, so I think there's an awful lot of work we all need to do in, in industry, um, government, 
um, in, uh, in academia and in, in the public domain as well, and media has a big role to play in this as well. It started a bit in children's TV, she said with a 16-year-old, 16-month-old daughter. Um, uh, there's something called Nina and the Neurons, if anyone has children um, <laughs> or grandchildren. And, um, and Nina and the Neurons talk about engineers now as well. And I think that's a really, really good thing to get into the psyche of, of children so they grow up thinking and knowing that it's no different. Um, and, and engineers are, are, should be very well respected as a profession as well. So things are happening, but, um, but there's an awful lot more work that we all need to do to improve it. I think right up at the back, I've got one there. Oh, okay, we've got, we've got three there, and I'm going to do one down there. Okay, yeah. um, as a scientist, this breaks my heart to, to ask you, really, but um, just to play devil's advocate, you were talking about the um, sensors, the wider sensors for um, growing crops, and you linked it to the need for water and so on. Um, charities have shown, like WaterAid, have shown that um, bottom-down... Um, sorry, bottom-up systems uh, like building wells and, and education in places like Africa that need water um, are very useful. Um, so why can't we plug the money that's going into all these wireless, perhaps not sustainable options into building wells and so forth in Africa instead and, and India and Nepal? Sorry, it's a horrible question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one that I would find very difficult to answer because I don't own all of these budgets. I don't think it should be one or the other. Um, I think we should have a, a bottom-up approach. Um, but, but I think it's good to have technology working on, on things that really matter. And this is one of the world engineering grand challenges and so we need engineers to work on it, and that's, that's the way we're working on it. To me, it shouldn't be one or the other. Uh, we should be able to do both. Since the microphone's up there, I'll take one more up there, then I'll go down there, and then I've got loads of hands up, and we'll see how we're doing then. You mentioned about the importance of working like in multidisciplinary groups, but as students, we can be quite siloed in small groups. Um, how would you kind of suggest if kind of students working together on different projects and ideas as well? How you suggest students work more together or students work yeah, more with... Yeah, students from different disciplines, because sometimes it's quite hard to go from your discipline to another. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really difficult to, to get that interdisciplinarity sometimes. Um, and I think some of that is the way, the way we examine you. Um, and even though we want you all to work together, then we all try and examine you in very sort of different silos. Uh, what we're trying to work towards is to, to become much more interdisciplinary, um, uh, not only in faculties, but across faculty as well. So in, in the Faculty of Engineering and Science, uh, Physical Sciences, we are, um, the engineering schools are starting to work together a lot more so the students actually benefit from either their, their final year uh, projects or their group projects that they might do. So we're getting electronic engineers and mechanical engineers and chemical engineers to start working together and to have a much more um, normal environment that you'd have in, in industry where you would work not just with people of your own profession but um, ones from, from different subjects as well. So we're starting to do that a little bit more um, within the curriculum itself. Outside the curriculum, there are lots of, um, as I'm sure you know, lots of uh, societies and I think it's great to see those societies when they're all mixing um, from, a, from a social point of view, but actually from a, um, from a subject point of view as well. And it's really important that we do all mix it. Um, it's great to, when, you, when you're at some of those social events and seeing all the different students there, the different conversations that you have and the way um, a, a scientist might look at a, proj a, a, a problem or an engineer or an artist or um, a linguist and might look at the, the problem in a very different way, and I think that's a, a really good thing to do. So, but I think we, we do need to, to do more of it, for sure. Got one question down here, and then I think there's there. Yeah. Got one, and then there's one just there. Thank you, thank you again uh, uh, for a fascinating lecture, and you can feel, perhaps in the tone of my voice, there's a but here. <laughs> um, because the fascination is with the involvement and the experimentation and the going to, to the whole project. Uh, and the but is the experience of watching 
in both of our children's families, two 16-year-old girls being put through what they're being put through right now, which, which could hardly be more extreme at the reductive, mechanical, just crushing the learning. And, and it, it seems astounding that in my generation where perhaps 4% of us got to university, they were from across society, and it wasn't that difficult, and now we've got 10 times as many, and they are, their, their childhood is being crushed. And as an employer of these people, when they come through the system, what they're not learning, I'm sorry, this is it's not a rant, and it, the, the, the question comes, is that I know from my contacts with people like yourself, people in front of me here at the university, you all feel this, but forgive me, we don't hear you making this point where it counts in government. It may be behind the scenes, but just like we've had all this nightmare of Europe having two or three decades of anti-Europe hardly being responded to by anybody until it may be too late. The same thing is happening in education, that the forces of ticking the boxes and satisfying the specification are overwhelming us, and I'm not hearing your voice enough. Can I assure you, can I assure you that there is extensive work that goes on from senior staff in the university on a very regular basis with all senior politicians? I can't say it's been successful. But very, very hard work done, particularly on, for example, practicals in schools. It's so important to us that we do get this, the next generation of, of students coming through who are, are comfortable with their practical work because the more, the more comfortable they come to the university, the more we can push them. Whereas if we have to spend a year bridging that, then they leave with less than, than we would like. So, so yes, I agree with Nancy, there's an awful lot of work and, and, going and on. We do see the difference in students coming into university. Um, there's a sense that, that you know, we have to change their attitude, that, you know, to the failure, you know, the inventiveness, the curiosity and so on, which there's yeah. a risk with the exam system is being lost. But yeah, absolutely. I've got one up there and then I'll come down here and there's a few in the middle. Yes. Um, on a more, more specific point, in your own work on the square kilometre array, um, what engineering aspects or problems are keeping you awake at night? <laughs> Assuming it's not just your... Uh, 16-month-old. <laughs> yeah, my 16-month-old sleeps really well now, actually. Um, uh, yeah, it's more the, more the problems that keep me awake now. Um, so, so from my work, I, um, I work on the front end of, of the receivers. So, so I, um, I design low-noise amplifiers um, for, for, for receivers. Um, the SKA as a project gives engineers so many problems and, and especially um, engineers who worked on radio astronomy projects before because we have to think of it in such a different way. Normally for, um, for a radio astronomy projects so or for telescopes, um, you might have a fair few of them, you know, of the order of tens um, uh, or it might be a very big telescope and, but there's not that many, it's not industry production. And so when you're designing your amplifier and then you test it and you put it on the telescope and test it again, if it hasn't squeezed the last bit of noise out of it, you can take it off and, and get one of the, the technicians and say, can you just sort of tweak this and do that and we'll change this. And then we put it back on again and, and we try it. And, and they're very much um, uh, bespoke things and we're used to them being very bespoke. For the SKA, we have to totally rethink how we, how we engineer radio astronomy projects. It's industry levels of work now, um, and we need industry to be massively involved in the SKA. So you can't, if you're designing um, low noise amplifiers for hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of, of antennas, you can't just go to the technician, actually, could you just change a couple of those bonds and you know, just change that 12 million times? Um, they need to be done in such a way that you give a very robust design to industry and they print out, they punch out, you know, a million of them for you and then give you them all back knowing that you can just plug them in and they're going to work and they're going to be robust enough to deal with the environment um, as well as the, the very stringent specs on it. 
So it's this shift, and it's a massive shift um, of how you would normally do a radio astronomy project from an engineering point of view to the SKA, and it's such a different way. So that's the thing that would keep me awake. Okay, we've got a question at the front. Um, I just wanted to say, um, would you agree that the engineering needs to be more accessible to people in general, i.e. like creating um, phone apps, um, apps on your phone that are like games, but in an engineering sense, so that people are more critical in their, like, so that it becomes more accessible to, to people and you get more ideas, you generate more ideas and you solve uh, more problems, you know, within engineering as with, you know, um, the big engineering, the, the big project you have across Australia and South Africa. So I just wanted to... I yeah, just yeah, I, th I think engineering needs to be very, very accessible for everyone. Um, and I think we need to approach it in many different ways. And, and one of the ways, I think, is via stealth. So we need to sort of get, get lots of things happening, like apps on phones and things like that, and get people um, and doing that and feeling very comfortable and very confident they're doing that. And then sort of go, hey, do you know what? That was engineering. And so there's this sort of whole stealth approach to it as well. Um, and, and so people, all of a sudden, it's just in people's psyche that, that what they're doing and all of these things around them is engineering, and so people start to get much more an appreciation about it. Once we get to that point, um, and we have a, an education system that supports this, then I think we'll, we'll get a lot more engineers coming through that still have their curiosity and their innovation and their ingenious in within them. We'll take two more, because we are running out of time. I've got one here. I have reached the princely age of 84. Congratulations. And because in 1948, when I was 17, I decided to take up electronic engineering and I found out that a chap called Williams had just built a computer in Manchester. And on that basis, I chose to go to Manchester University, where subsequently I graduated and was then a postgraduate. I then worked for 40 years or more in the engineering industry, becoming chief engineer of the second busy, biggest electrical engineering, electronic engineering company in the country. But over those years, I had the privilege of having a well-paid hobby. Because for me, engineering always held a fascination. And the only way that I can describe it was that engineering is turning science to the benefit of humanity. It was then, and it still is. I absolutely Thank you. agree with you, yeah. yeah. And I'd also like to say, if you don't have any links with the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, please talk to me, because you would be great to come and talk to our students about your experiences as well. Well, you've talked yourself into a job. <laughs> We've got lots of hands, but I'm just going to take one last question. I can see the person with the microphone. It's all powerful. Right. Um, I don't want to be controversial, but as but a you're female about to engineer, <laughs> who is a f who, I'm lucky enough to be a fellow of my professional institution, and... The figures that are being quoted is that we've, we've, we've doubled the number of fellows by going from 2% to 4% that are female. How do we encourage women <laughs> to take that number. extra step <laughs> and actually go and be more prevalent there and being more influential? Because I know that there are more people coming in in terms of students and into career space, but then people like yourself are inspirational because you're still out there doing it even though you've got a family for example how do we encourage young women or middle-aged women to take that extra step and take the responsibility yeah I, it's a great question and that's the other thing that would keep me awake at night as well is this is this question of of more females in in engineering um, there are so many initiatives that happen even at, at university as well and and um, to look at, at the number of women in engineering and trying to get more, more women, uh, more females into our subjects at university as well. And you look at all the initiatives that happen and actually the numbers haven't changed that much in 10 years. Mm. And you look at it and you're like, wow, you know, the amount of, of support and effort that we get from, from students, ex-students, from academics, 
um, from professional support staff. Why hasn't that changed so much in, in 10 years? And I think the way, personally, I think the way we, we can solve it is literally going back, and it's a, this is a long-term plan, going back to primary school, and it's this whole idea of getting it um, into the psyche of, of everyone, boys and girls, and of the influences as well, so the, the parents and the teachers, that engineering is a good thing for girls to do. You, you don't lose your creative spirit. You have to be creative when you're an engineer, um, and, and you will be an engineer, better engineer, if you are more creative. Um, and to show that you, you can solve world problems by engineering, indeed, that's what many of the, how many of the world problems are solved is via the engineering. And so get it into the psyche. I'd love to get to the point where we don't have a National Women in Engineering Day, because why would we? Um, but we're nowhere near that at the moment. So I think there's a long-term plan to get to that point, but we have to do those short-term steps along the way as well. And I think encouraging uh, more people in industry, more people in academia, more female role models in both of those, more people um, who, who were great stories to tell from their time when they were working, whether that's they're now retired or they're taking a break, um, talking to younger people, people coming to university, having role models out there um, is a really, really important thing. So short term, I think we need to get more role models, but longer term, there has to be a much, much bigger plan. And I think we need to start with, with um, primary school and their influences, the teachers and the, the parents as well. So one of the things I learned from the books that I referred to at the beginning was that many of the breakthroughs of Rutherford and Cockcroft were through the equipment that they built, the engineering that they did. And that actually led to scientific breakthroughs. And, and it is true of many aspects of science. And I think what we hope for the Cockcroft Rutherford lecture to be is informative, um, educational, um, but also fun. And I hope you'll agree that Danielle has done all of that. Thank you. I'd now like to invite the head of our alumni association, indeed the head of your alumni association, Janine, please. Thank you, Nancy, for facilitating this. And thank you as well to the team who organise this event every year. I think everyone enjoys it. We come year after year. It's lovely to see familiar faces and new faces as well. Um, but it's always my delightful task to present a small gift to uh, the person who presents the lecture. So, Danielle, thank you ever so much. I think you can tell from the volume and the enthusiasm of the questions that you have inspired this audience. And we will go back and inspire our own colleagues, our families, our young people, and I hope they come and engage in science in years to come. And I think we will all turn up at ESOF, the European Science Festival, later this year, if only to see Lem, our robot, <laughs> not just play a string instrument, but I think Lem will expect it to deliver some poetry as well. <laughs> yeah. so, so you've set yourself a challenge yeah, there. A but challenge. it's my delight to present you with this oh, small thank gift. You so thank much. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.